while watching the NVIDIA CEO Jensen Wang's keynote at Computex 2024, something truly fascinating struck me. The technical wizardry and forward-thinking vision presented seemed to leap straight out of the pages of a science fiction novel. It reminded me of the technologies we've seen depicted in shows like Westworld and Psychopaths, if you've seen it, where artificial intelligence reshapes the fabric of society. As Jensen unveiled NVIDIA's groundbreaking projects, it was clear that the line between the imagined and the real is not just blurring, it's merging. Today, let's explore these cutting-edge advancements, starting with the intriguing segment from the keynote, the introduction of Earth 2. This is Earth 2. The idea that we would create a digital twin of the Earth, that we would go and simulate the Earth so that we could predict the future of our planet to better avert disasters or better understand the impact of climate change so that we can adapt better, so that we could change our habits now. This digital twin of Earth is probably one of the most ambitious projects that the world's ever undertaken, and we're taking step, large steps every single year. This ambitious initiative isn't just about advanced computing, it's about simulating our entire planet to predict climate phenomena and manage environmental disasters before they unfold. Here's a glimpse of what Jensen had to say about Earth 2. Someday in the near future, we will have continuous weather prediction at every, at every square kilometer on the planet. You will always know what the climate's gonna be. You will always know. And this will run continuously because we train the AI and the AI requires so little energy. This shift in interaction brings us to an important discussion about ChatGPT, how it has changed perspectives on AI and what it means for future technologies. Here's what he had to say about that. ChatGPT came along and, um, and something is very important in this slide. Here, let me show you something. This slide, okay, and this slide. The fundamental difference is this. Until ChatGPT revealed it to the world, AI was all about perception, natural language understanding, computer vision, speech recognition. It's all about perception and detection. This was the first time the world saw a generative AI. It produced tokens, one token at a time. And those tokens were words. Some of the tokens, of course, could now be images or charts or tables, songs, words, speech, videos. Those tokens could be anything. They, anything that, that you can learn the meaning of. It could be tokens of chemicals, tokens of proteins, genes. You saw earlier in Earth 2, we were generating tokens of the weather. We can, we can learn physics. If you can learn physics, you could teach an AI model physics. The, the AI model could learn the meaning of physics, and it can generate physics. We were scaling down to one kilometer, not by using filtering, it was generating. And so we can use this method to generate tokens for almost anything, almost anything of value. We can generate steering wheel control for a car. We can generate articulation for a robotic arm. Everything that we can learn, we can now generate. We have now arrived, not at the AI era, but a generative AI era. It's fascinating to think about historical parallels where innovation sparked entire industrial revolutions. In the late 1890s, Nikola Tesla invented an AC generator. We invented an AI generator. The AC generator generated electrons. 
NVIDIA's AI generator generates tokens. Both of these things have large market opportunities. It's completely fungible in almost every industry. And that's why it's a new industrial revolution. And now we have a new factory, a new computer. And what we will run on top of this is a new type of software. And we call it NIMS, NVIDIA Inference Microservices. Now what, what happens is the NIM runs inside this factory. And this NIM is a pre-trained model. It's an AI. Well, this AI is, of course, quite complex in itself. But the, co the computing stack that runs AIs are insanely complex. When you go and use ChatGPT, underneath their stack is a whole bunch of software. Underneath that prompt is a ton of software. And it's incredibly complex because the models are large, billions to trillions of parameters. It doesn't run on just one computer. It runs on multiple computers. It has to distribute the workload across multiple GPUs, tensor parallelism, pipeline parallelism, data parallelism, all kinds of parallelism, expert parallelism, all kinds of parallelism, distributing the workload across multiple GPUs, processing it as fast as possible, because if you are in a factory, if you run a factory, your throughput directly correlates to your revenues. Your throughput directly correlates to quality of service. And your throughput directly correlates to the number of people who can use your service. We are now in a world where data center throughput utilization is vitally important. It was important in the past, but not vitally important. It was important in the past, but people don't measure it. Today, every parameter is measured. Start time, uptime, utilization, throughput, idle time, you name it because it's a factory. When something is a factory, its operations directly correlate to the financial performance of the company. And so we realize that this is incredibly complex for most companies to do. So what we did was we created this AI in a box, and it containers an incredible amount of software. Inside this container is CUDA, QDNN, TensorRT, Triton for inference services. It is cloud native so that you could auto scale in a Kubernetes environment. It has management services and hooks so that you can monitor your AIs. It has common APIs, standard APIs, so that you could literally chat with this box. We now have the ability to create large language models and pre-trained models of all kinds. And we, we have all of these various versions whether it's language-based or vision-based or imaging-based, or we have versions that are available for healthcare, digital biology. We have versions that are digital humans that I'll talk to you about. And the way you use this, oh, just come to ai.nvidia.com. And today we uh, just posted up in Hugging Face the Llama 3 NIM, fully optimized. It's available there for you to try. And you can even take it with you. It's available to you for free. Jensen also explored how AI's role has expanded beyond the traditional tasks, moving into a phase where it starts to interact, predict, and think more like a human. One of the most important applications in the coming future, of course, is customer service agents. Customer service agents are necessary in just about every single industry. It represents trillions of dollars. Of, of customer service around the world. Nurses are customer service agents um, in some ways. Some of them are non-prescription or, or non-diagnostics-based uh, um, uh, nurses uh, are essentially customer service. Uh, customer service for retail, for uh, quick service foods, financial services, insurance, just tens and tens of millions of customer service can now be augmented by language models and augmented by AI. And so these, one, these boxes that you see are basically NIMS. Some of the NIMS are reasoning agents. Given a task, figure out what the mission is, break it down into a plan. Some of the NIMS retrieve information. Some of the NIMS might uh, 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 go and do search. Some of the NIMS uh, might uh, use a tool, like Co-op that I was talking about earlier. It could use a tool that uh, could be running on SAP 
And so it has to learn a particular uh, language called ABAP. Maybe some NIMS have to uh, uh, do SQL queries. And so all of these NIMS are experts that are now assembled as a team. So what's happening? The application layer has been changed. What used to be applications written with instructions are now applications that are assembling teams. Just as transformative technologies in the past fundamentally changed our economy and way of life, NVIDIA is at the forefront of a similar shift today. Just like the way the industrial revolution helped transition us from creating goods by hand to using machines, the AI revolution or generative AI will do the same thing for intelligence. This can of course be debated, but we're starting to hear more and more about self-improving AI and how different AIs do better at specific tasks. Very few people know how to write programs. Almost everybody knows how to break down a problem and assemble teams. Very, every company, I believe, in the future will have a large collection of NIMS, and you would bring down the experts that you want. You connect them into a team, and you, you don't even have to figure out exactly how to connect them. You just give the mission to an agent, to a NIM, to figure out who to break the tasks down and who to give it to. And they, that, that central, the leader of the, of the application, if you will, the leader of the team, would break down the task and give it to the various team members. The team members would do their, perform their task, bring it back to the team leader, the team leader would reason about that, and present an information back to you. Just like humans. This is in our near future. This is the way applications are going to look. I believe that this is inevitable and we might see some updates from OpenAI about AI agents. If not this year, early next year is what many people predict. The system needed underneath all of this technology is getting cheaper and cheaper. Not only that, it is also getting better and faster in the meantime. We believe that by reducing the cost of computing incredibly, the market developers, scientists, inventors will continue to discover new algorithms that consume more and more and more computing. So that one day, something happens. That a phase shift happens that the marginal cost of computing is so low that a new way of using computers emerge. In fact, that's what we're seeing now. Over the years, we have driven down the marginal cost of computing in the last 10 years in one particular algorithm by a million times. Well, as a result, it is now very logical and very common sense to train large language models with all of the data on the internet. Nobody thinks twice. This idea that you could create a computer that could process so much data to write its own software, the emergence of artificial intelligence, was made possible because of this complete belief that if we made computing cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, somebody's going to find a great use. Well, today, CUDA has achieved the virtuous cycle Install base is growing, computing costs is coming down, which causes more developers to come up with more ideas, which drives more demand. And now we're on the, in the beginning of something very, very important. Let me talk about what's next. The next wave of AI is physical AI. AI that understands the laws of physics. AI that can work among us. And so they have to understand the world model so that they understand how to interpret the world, how to perceive the world. They have to, of course, have excellent cognitive capabilities so they can understand us, understand what we asked, and perform the tasks. In the future, robotics is a much more per pervasive idea. Of course, when I say robotics, there's a humanoid robotics that's usually the representation of that. But that's not at all true. Everything is going to be robotic. All of the factories will be robotic. The factories will orchestrate robots, and those robots will be building 
products that are robotic. Robots interacting with robots, building products that are robotic. Now, of course, we could interact with these large, these AI services with text prompts and speech prompts. However, there are many applications where we would like to interact with what, what is otherwise a human-like form. We call them digital humans. NVIDIA has been working on digital human technology for some time. Let me show it to you. Digital humans has the potential of being a great interact, interactive agent with you. They make much more engaging. They could be much more empathetic. And of course, um, we have to uh, uh, cross this incredible chasm, this uncanny chasm of realism, so that the digital humans would appear much more natural. Welcome. Here we go. About my size. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.